How are you going to bring project-based learning to your school? Will it be top-down? Will it be grassroots? Whole staff? Leadership team? There's a lot of different ways to implement. My book, PBL Simplified, there's two chapters on this, leaders. So go get that book, read through it, and start to think through that idea. Then once you're ready, we have a conference coming up in June where you and your team come to Indianapolis and you create a three-year plan for implementing project-based learning. You can't just wing this. You can't just get started and say, well, this is the right direction, so we'll get there. You need to come up with a solid plan. You're the leader. That's the whole point. It's part of your job is being the visionary for your team and for your school. So this is a team track. It's not just for you. It's for you and your team. Bring a leadership team. Bring some key teachers with you and start to plan this out. You can sign up for this two-day conference. It's going to be in Indianapolis. You can sign up in the show notes to get your team on the schedule. Are your teachers fighting apathy in their classrooms? Are your teachers burned out and leaving your school? Are you having a hard time finding the passion and the fire that you used to have? If you answered yes to any of these questions, you are in the right place. My name is Ryan Stoyer, and this is the PBL Simplified Podcast dedicated to equipping you to being a visionary leader who's committed to self-development, collaboration, and changing education. You're a visionary leader, so you see that three years out. That's your job. You see that as your commitment, what you bring to your team, and you also see this work as a moral imperative. We've got to get our learners empowered. We have to get them away from passive as quickly as we can, because that's how they're going to be successful in K-12. That's how they're going to be successful in the workplace. That's how they'll be successful in college. And you can't stop just if it hurts somebody's feelings. Like This is the work you were called to do. So welcome, visionary leader. You are in the right place. On the second Wednesday of the month, we do a PBL showcase episode. So we do a deep dive into a PBL unit. We bring a teacher in here and we go through his or her PBL unit in depth. You get to hear student stories. You get to hear how they planned it, what they would do differently. As a leader, you do need to know what great PBL looks like. And as a teacher leader, these are inspiring stories. So this, these are ones you definitely want to share with your staff to say, hey, we can get there. This is what it looks like. So in today's episode, we're also going to have a need to know on how long should a PBL unit take. The Leadership Leap is going to be on Atomic Habits by James Clear, the book that's been number one on Amazon for about forever. And then we'll touch base on our PBL showcase with Carolyn White today. Athletic Greens has 75 high-quality vitamins, minerals, whole foods, and sourced nutrients. You need a green drink in the morning. I've been using one for years now, and it gives you that extra oomph to start your day. Athletic Greens helps you build a healthy daily habit in one minute per day, promotes gut health, supports immunity, and boosts energy and more. Check out the link in the show notes to get a bonus travel pack and a vitamin D supplement. Our need to know for today is how long should a PBL unit take? This need to know comes up in every workshop that we do, and rightfully so. We have timelines in schools, right? We, we need times so that we know what's important, where to put our priorities. And that's really where this question should go, this need to know should go, is what are the priorities? Your PBL unit should take as long as it would normally take you to address the standards, even in a traditional unit. You shouldn't take four weeks on haikus. You should take four weeks on argumentative writing. So if your PBL unit is steeped in big, chunky, beefy standards, then it's okay for it to take more time. If you've got this great PBL unit idea, but it's got a ton of fluffy, little bitty uh, standards that shouldn't take four weeks or so, then you shouldn't be spending that much time on it. And it really is that simple. Uh, you want to plan it out. You don't suddenly get more time when you're doing PBL. It has to fit into your curriculum map. Now, when you go with project-based learning, you're going to add a couple days. You're going to have an entry event. It might not take a full day or a class period. It depends on if you're elementary or secondary, like kind of how you launch that. But you're going to add that. You didn't have that in your traditional unit, likely. You're also going to have a practice presentation day where your learners can practice what it is they're going to say in front of their community partners, in front of an authentic audience. And then you are going to have that presentation day. So those are three additional times that you're adding into the mix for your PBL unit. So that's the additional time. But a lot of that otherwise, if you look at PBL versus a project, I've got a couple of YouTube videos out there, some other ideas there, we're really moving things around quite a bit. If you've got a really great scaffolding unit, 
that follows up on a quiz, you should still be using that, right? So you're not gonna be adding a ton of different things into your PBL unit. You be very cognizant of your time. So, but if you keep those things in time, in, in your mind of, am I hitting beefy standards? Am I gonna bookend this with an entry event and a presentation? Do I have time for that? That should give you a pretty good idea of how long your PBL unit should take. There's no two weeks, four weeks. I do typically say, if, if you know, if you're pretty new to this and you've got this great idea and it's gonna be a nine week PBL, that's probably too long for you, right? Just to sustain the engagement throughout that. Things are getting a little more complicated when you're going that long. If you're a veteran PBLer and you're like, hey, I got this, like, sure, I'll support you 100%. There's no hard and fast rule for that. But if you're starting out, like a two week PBL unit would be just fine. Four weeks makes a lot of sense, right? So find something that's a sweet spot that you can try it out, you can learn from it, and your learners can learn from it. That's how long a PBL unit should take. The Leadership Leap is meant to take you as a leader and leapfrog you forward by going through a different book each week. Uh, we're going to look at different leadership books, whether it's in education, business, or sports, and pull out some of those ideas and see how we can use them in education, how you can use them to lead your building. Because as you become a better leader, you're going to have a better school, a better vision, and better outcomes. So today we're looking at Atomic Habits by James Clear. And sometimes I recommend, you know, you can listen to a book as I run through it. Maybe you learn a few things. Maybe you grab the book. Maybe you don't. This is one you need to have on your shelf. Uh, and not, it's not just me that's voted for this. Again, it's, um, it's been an Amazon bestseller for years now, like number one. Uh, and there's a reason for that. Uh, James also has a ton of additional helps that go along with this in Building Habits. And his email list really is probably one of the best. Uh, he says he's got the most wisdom and the less words uh, than any email on the internet. And I think he's right. Like it's one that I open up every week. So I would definitely get on board with James. Clear as you look at Atomic Habits. I talked about early on in the year uh, in actually achieving your goals in that podcast. And he uses really great metaphor of goals are the rudder, show you where to go, but your habits are the oars that get you there. So he continually looks at how do your daily habits get you to where you wanna be. So here are a couple quotes. If you're having trouble changing your habits, the problem isn't you, the problem is your system. Bad habits repeat themselves again and again, not because you don't want to change, but because you have the wrong system for change. You do not rise to the level of your goals, you fall to the level of your systems. So if you're ready to be a high achiever and you wanna be a high flyer, a visionary learner, leader, at some point you do need to look at your systems. Like you need to make that shift from kind of the hoorah leader who does all the work and does all the things and makes it happen to a systems-based leader where systems are moving your work forward. There's a huge difference and it's not nearly as exciting, but it works. So again, this is an idea you can get right from James Clear in his book, Atomic Habits, and I absolutely love it. So why tiny changes lead to remor remarkable results? Here's another quote from the book. It's so easy to overestimate the importance of one defining moment and underestimate the value of making real, small improvements on a daily basis. Too often we convince ourselves that massive success requires massive action. Whether it's losing weight, building a business, writing a book, winning a championship, or achieving another goal, like moving your school system to project-based learning, we put pressure on ourselves to make some earth-shattering improvement that everyone will talk about. And what Clear walks you through is this idea that it's the small things that you do. As a leader, it's that green drink, that athletic greens, it's working out every day, it's reading every day. Those are the things that make you a better leader and they add up. And it's the same thing with your staff. How do I get everybody to have this giant moment where they all suddenly love PBL? It was probably more small moments of celebrating the great things that are happening in those PBL classrooms. Showing people where they have some PBL momentum already and they'd be even better off when they go through training and coaching and that they'll be able to do these amazing things. But it's probably not the big epiphany. It's the small things that you do. What are you putting in the newsletter that you put out each week? Are you celebrating uh, traditional teaching still? Or are you celebrating student-centered teaching? What are the small things that you do on a daily basis? And again, Atomic Habits isn't necessarily geared towards education, but it is a great leadership book. 
in all great leadership books, I think, are really the idea is making you the person that you were called to be. And when that happens for you, your leadership changes, right? The work that you do on a daily basis changes because you see the world differently. So it really is about changing your identity as a leader and then helping your staff and your team change their identity from you know being a traditional teacher who's who's passive and does whatever's in the book and does whatever they're told to a, an empowered staff member, teacher, who's looking for opportunities for their learners all the time. So he goes through different ideas. He's got affirmations that he looks at. Uh, let me give you another uh, key idea in Atomic Habits. Identity change is the North Star of habit change. The remainder of this book will provide you with step-by-step instructions on how to build better habits for yourself, your family, your team, your company, and anywhere else you wish. But the true question is, are you becoming the type of person you want to become? The first step is not what or how, but who. You need to know who you want to be. Otherwise, your quest for change is like a boat without a rudder, and that's why we're starting here. So you have to define what kind of leader you want to be. That's why I'm using this language of a managing leader versus a visionary leader. You need to commit to being a visionary leader that people want to follow, that are inspired to follow. When they see you, when they hear you, they think that they're a part of something bigger because they are. And when you start to see yourself with that identity, I mean, you can buy yourself new shoes if that helps you see that. But what James starts to look at is what are the habits that a leader, a visionary leader would have? And as you start to do those habits, you work out, you get enough sleep, you journal, like you find those high flyer habits that work for you in your morning routine. And you do those every day because that's what visionary leaders do. And then you convince yourself through perseverance and faith that you are that leader. Say, well, how do I know? How do I know that I'm that leader? Because look at my morning routine. I've been doing this for years now. I've got my green drink. I journal. I have affirmations. I have a gratitude journal. I am the type of leader that's a high flyer that understands how to lead people. So he he goes through a a lot of this. And some of this, when you're looking at a habit book, you might say, well, Ryan, just tell me what I'm supposed to do, right? Hey, James Clear, just tell me what I'm supposed to do. He does that too. He has very practical making and creating good habits, breaking bad habits. Uh, He's got several laws that he goes through on like just habit change. But he's just couched them in such a great way that leaders really buy into this. And that's why I think his book's number one all the time. So he looks through, like, how do you break a bad habit? Like, stop putting the chips right at eye level. Like, at one point, he puts, like, if you put them up on a shelf in the garage, you're much less likely to go for those chips, right? And then how do you set up your environment so that uh, you're successful, right? I'm going to bring these podcasts to you every week, right? So what do I do? I carry a microphone with me all the time. Right. And some people will joke around, they'll kind of rib me a little bit like, oh, ready to podcast right now? Actually, yes. Right. Like if you would be a great guest, I'm going to do an episode right now. If I come up with that idea that I need right now, I'm going to do it. But what did I do? I made it easy for me to be successful. If you look around your office, what are you making it easy to do? Right. As you set up your environment, you can make those good habits easier or you can make them more difficult. And he's going to go through the nuts and bolts of setting up those habits, how to make the good ones easier to do, how to make the bad ones harder to do, so that you can set up those things that you want to do and that you want to be as a leader. So let's wrap this one up. It says, the secrets of getting results that last is to never stop making improvements. It's remarkable what you can build if you just don't stop. Small habits don't add up, they compound. That's the power of atomic habits, tiny changes, remarkable results. Another book that I like in this same vein is called The Slight Edge. So all these little things that we do as leaders that add up to success. You know, sometimes people will ask me like, well, how do you, how do you have your success, right? Like, how did you become a leader? How did you create this organization that has great impact across the country? And it's like, well, I did a lot of really small things over the last decade and I do them every single day that's not usually the answer that people are looking for, right? They're looking for like some formula. It's like, well, I journal, I meditate, I listen to podcasts, I read daily, I play with my family. That's that's actually one of my goals for the day is play is on there. So I make sure that I'm playing. I also have listened fully to people in my family. I appreciate someone and I exercise. I do that those things all the time. 
Now, did I wake up one day and suddenly do all of them? Absolutely not. It was about a little bit of improvement in each one of those areas till it became a habit. And it's just something I do as part of my identity. And this book has been a huge part of that. Atomic Habits by James Clear. You've got to get it on your shelf. Look in the show notes. We'll give you a link right to it. Today's episode is with Carolyn White. She's out on the East Coast. She's a high school English teacher, and she's doing amazing things with juniors in English. Can we all agree that that's not typically the place where giant loads of engagement lie, right? Not everybody loves high school English. Um, English teachers, sometimes it's hard for us to believe that, right? But you also see it daily, right, on on the daily. So uh, you're going to hear a lot of passion come from Carolyn. You're going to hear that Uh, Her learners were not always awake and alive. They were passive and sitting there and waiting to be fed. But now they're engaged, empowered, moving, and making a difference. Enjoy this episode. Well, PBL Simplified podcast listeners, we've got another PBL showcase today. That's going to be the second Wednesday of the month. We always talk to a teacher in the field doing the work. And we have them break down a PBL unit for us. Because you get to hear about it. You always ask, you know, well, do you have any examples? We do have examples, but we want to we don't want to give you just a plain example or a planning form. We want you to hear about kind of the heart of a PBL unit. We want you to hear about all the context around a PBL unit. So that's why we invite in people like Carolyn. So Carolyn, thank you for joining us today. Oh, thank you for having me. <laughs> Absolutely. Would you give our listeners just a little bit of your kind of your background? Like where are you from? What do you teach? Sure. So um, I am currently in Calvert County, Maryland, and I teach 11th and 12th grade English. Awesome. And then, you know, this is always the first question is, what is your why for education? Yeah, so I kind of have an interesting um, why, at least I think so. I'm a career changer, um, and I did it pretty quickly. So my undergrad was in business and finance, um, and I quickly found that it was kind of like a soulless thing. I actually ended up in HR and I was working with people. I was hiring and firing them. And I found this kind of um, connected thing that people really struggled to think deeply about issues and then articulate Mm -hmm. their thoughts. So I started thinking about where can that help? Where can I help that situation and kind of regain this um, wanting to make a difference? Because that's something I had always wanted to do. So my why became, I really wanna help my students be able to articulate um, their whys, so their thoughts and um, what drives them. But there was this disconnect. So that was what drove me into education was to to look into how I could help them find their whys. I I love that idea. What a a great journey, that's so exciting. like you, one, I like that you were like in a place where like, this is not filling my soul and that's not what I'm here for. So I'm going to find something that does fill my soul. And here you are, right? In education, talking to teenagers right before they get to head out into the into college or the workforce. And you get to do just that, like help them find their why. That's exciting. Yeah. Super exciting. So we've got a little bit of context about you, why you're in this for the work. We know that it's not just a side gig, right? Or you needed a job. It's like, this is your passion. This is your work. So Give us an example of one of your PBL units that you're really excited about. And just let's walk through it together. Sure. So um, to give a little more background, I actually just worked with Ryan this summer and um, kind of got dragged into PBL um, and so happy I did. But I decided to, when school started, I just jumped right into a PBL full unit. Like we didn't test the waters. We didn't do anything. We just kind of ran with it. Um, And like I said, I teach um, 11th grade English. And the way our county works is every quarter, there's a writing focus. So our standards in the first quarter um, all revolve around narrative. So looking at narratives, what makes narratives, and an element of that is personal essay. Well, when I looked at my 11th and 12th, well, my 11th graders, um, I wanted to find something that would hook them. And to be honest, 11th grade English does not hook them. So I, you know, what hooks them, they're starting to drive, they're starting to be in the workforce, all those things. So our like driving question became focused on um, this idea that um, when 2020 hit, we had this great resignation happen in the workforce. 
And now if you read or even see, businesses are having a really hard time retaining and keeping or attracting and retaining employees. So my, the driving question for my students became, how can we help the small businesses in our area um, attract young people and then retain young people? And we did this through the lens of looking at personal essays and the different texts that we cover in 11th grade English. Yeah, that's so good because it's such an authentic problem, right? Like it's real, it's happening right now. Small business owners have a for, for real need that your teenagers can help like figure out, right? Because it turns out that they're not intrinsically excited about 11th grade English. Like we think they should be, right? But not so much. And I also just want to make a point that it's great to see you just dive in, right? Would you recommend that for others that have, you know, taken a training with, as you've watched people implement, is it better to ease in or just dive right in? So I am a person who it doesn't bother me if things don't go well. Mm, so good. diving in wasn't a big deal for me because my thought was then we can pull back. Um, yeah. So right. th that was easier for me. So I recommend, especially if you're overwhelmed, I think just diving in and doing it is better than trying to use the pieces here and there. Um, I also teach a forgiving content. So I think that helped me mm. as well. But I'm definitely... I won't do something if it has to go piece at a time because then I'll end up procrastinating. But if I just dive in, I think it's easier. <laughs> yeah, I love the growth mindset in that, right? Like just dive in and you'll figure out what works and what doesn't and and move from there. So you've got your teenagers set up, your 11th, 11th graders are set up to go out and help businesses. Like, so what does that look like? How do you introduce them to businesses or just this idea of it? So I was really excited about our entry events and um, I found um, just through kind of networking and some connections that I have, there is close to us um, a local, I want to call them a landscaper, but they're, they're not, they do all the like aeration and the, the, like the vitamins and minerals that they put on the grass and that okay. kind of stuff. But it's a very like um, labor intensive job, right? but they have such a high retention rate at their company. And I was really curious about that because how do you do something that is fairly labor intensive, but wanna, like people wanna stay? So she came in and well, she was going to come in and here was like snap to number one that we learned how to be flexible. Um, she was gonna come in and talk to the students about what they do as a company and what their culture is. Um, but every teacher knows that the beginning of the year is full of like unexpected like, oh, we're gonna have this assembly that we're just telling you about the day before. So the day she was supposed to come in, we had an um, assembly pop up. So we did it through Zoom and it worked out really nice. Um, but, and what ended up happening is I videoed one of her sessions and showed it to the other ones. And then if they had questions, they were able to email her. Like I emailed her a list of the questions that weren't covered in the video. Um, I like the I like the email edition there too because you're right you're gonna have to like things do pop up right if it's if it's not an assembly it's it's something right so things always pop up and we get this question a lot of you know if I can't meet if the community partner can't come in in person and talk to all four classes is Zoom okay does video work do you feel like you still got the engagement through the Zoom call and the email process so I I did feel that way. At first, I wasn't sure how it was going to go, but they were really engaged because she emailed back. Ah, so it like she created this like really great um, relationship with them. And like their 11th graders, they ask some like questions because one of the things that this company does as soon as you're hired is they send you a gift card, like welcoming you to the company. Mm. And like one, they all wanted to know where the gift cards for. So she gave a list and a lot of them emailed back, well, have you thought about these places? So it automatically created a very cool relationship between the students yeah. and the, you know, the community I mean, partner. Your 11th graders are trying to provide value, right? Right away. Like they're just, they're in the mindset of, I think I can help this business leader. And, you know, oh, you're sending them here. Your people might really want these. Right. And whether they're right or not, right? This is where people, I think we get hung up on. Whether you're right or not, what a great mindset for 11th graders to be in, right? In a helpful mindset, trying to help someone do their work even better. Yeah. How was the process of finding community partners? You kind of said your network. It's another place where people sometimes get a little leery. They are a little hesitant. Yeah. How was that process? So I, like I, so the, I didn't want to be a business person because I found it soulless, but I'm still very intrigued by it. And I have a lot of friends who 
um, are still part of it. So I reached out to my personal network and was like, "This, hey friends, this is what I'm doing. Do you know anybody? Um, and I got names that way. Um, mm-hmm. I'm also an introvert. So the idea sometimes of like cold calling places can be overwhelming. But the response I got back from people, I'll never hesitate again. Like the mm-hmm. people in our community want to be part. Like they're so excited to have, especially teenagers want to engage in like a productive and meaningful way with them. Like we have had so many good things with our community partners. Well, and what a great process you just outlined, Carolyn. It's, you know, and I love that you say that you're an introvert too, right? You're an introvert. <laughs> so I don't really, like I'm not yelling from the rooftops. Hey, everybody, come work come into my classroom. It's not your style, but your process of not even, Hey, can you come in? Do you know somebody who might want to come in? Right? Like that's a great technique to just say within your network, do you know anybody that might fulfill this need for my classroom? And then if I don't personally, I might know somebody that does. Yeah. Right. Great process. I love that. Do you have some some student stories that you can share, or, or maybe even we kind of skip to the end product? Like, what did yeah. what did your learners create throughout this process? So they ended up um, creating presentations of what they thought businesses could do or should do to kind of combat a lot of the things they saw as to what might put off a young person. Mm. So we tied that into like we. So it was narrative, like we had to stay on our narrative track because those are our standards. But we also tied some research elements into that. So like one of the the texts we read fiction wise was we looked at the crucible. Well, with that, we looked at toxic personalities and group think and the dangers of those things. Um, And a lot of my students started coming forth talking about the things that they don't like at work and how maybe their management doesn't get involved and they wished, and all I kept hearing was, I wish they would do this, I wish they would do this. So that's what we used as like fodder for our presentations is their wishes we turned into, well, let's make a proposal for how businesses can make the workplace more enjoyable because what they found is that money wasn't the driving force behind what kept people, it was the culture of the environment. So they gave suggestions on if you have these toxic people in the workplace, you can do this. If you have con artists, this is what you can do. Mm -hmm. So it was really interesting. If group think occurs, how do we do this? So they made these presentations and because it was a a jump in, I didn't want to overwhelm them. This was such a different way for them to approach English class than they ever had before. I was a little afraid if I turned the, um, the end product into something they hadn't done yet, they would push back. So we did PowerPoint but we stuck to like business rules. So like they had brand new rules for PowerPoint, like they couldn't do more than eight words on a line, no more than eight lines. Like they had to be very thoughtful. Um, And they did great in our um, initial um, person who did our entry event came back and watched the PowerPoints. Um, One student, this was a cool student story. One student told his dad and the dad asked if I would share some of the presentations with his company because he wanted to share it with it. So I thought that was really wow. authentic. And, and to have a student in 11th grade go home and tell their parent what they're working on, like jazzed me up. I was like, let's go. So yeah, um, 100%, that is awesome. Yeah, so, so there were pitfalls along the way. There was a lot of things that I had to learn. Um, and I didn't do every element of PBL in this first unit and my first attempt. But their excitement has driven me to find ways to do it. Um, and we've kind of pushed those into the other things that I've taught since then. So it's been very cool. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> Carolyn, there's so many great takeaways in, the, in your story of just this one PBL unit. And, and I know our listeners heard this and building leaders, your teachers are going to ask this question. I'm like, where do the standards fit with project-based learning? And you just hear Carolyn say again and again, like, we're like throughout, like we have to do them, right? You, you don't get to take time off of your standards to do neat projects, right? So it's how do you incorporate them? But now suddenly the crucible has more meaning to an 11th grader, right? Than it did before, because now it's moving towards helping these business leaders do this piece. So what it does is it adds more meaning to your standards. So it's actually a great help to your teachers. So if you're a bu- those building leaders, I know you're listening, when you hear this story, I want you to hear that, yes, there are standards at the heart of all of this work. And yes, it's also really great work. 
right? So, yeah, so actually one of the standards for, that we looked at is character development. So as they're analyzing like Abigail as this horrible human being, right? They're also looking, they had to delve deeper because I was, I was pushing them like, how is she a toxic person? Because we read a little bit about that. So they actually had to look for, for clues and evidence and pull things out. I think they went deeper because they were trying to prove that she would be this type of person in the workplace than if I had just said, Abigail's the villain. Well, that's so good, isn't it? I mean, just think about like higher order thinking skills and like, so yes, she's, you know, a bad person, we'll say, but uh, or a bad character made to be that way. But what would she be like in the workplace, right? Like that's totally different, right? So what a neat, uh, what a neat way to get to those skills that are difficult to get to, right? It's on the right side of your evaluation rubric, those types of things where they're really starting to transfer their skills and their learning to a whole different environment. Um, I also want to say for anyone who's listening, um, I don't teach like the top echelons of students. Like I have some in there, but I have a lot of really reluctant learners in my classroom and they were more engaged in this than I thought they would be. And it wasn't like they came in my classroom every day, super excited to be there, but they were more excited as each day went on. Um, yeah. And they realized that this wasn't going away. It wasn't just a project and that they were contributing to something more meaningful than like just the essay at the end of the quarter. Yeah, that's so important. Cause like, well, what, what learners does this work for? I always say, you know, only the, only the learners that you want to be engaged, right. Which of course is all of them, but you can't just leave it for those, those kids that are really good at school. And, you know, the research that's come out from the Lucas foundation shows that, you know, you can't just do skill and drill. It does not work uh, long-term for those kids that we say need it. Like they need to have the context of a PBL unit, right? To help understand the difficult portions. And yeah, English 11 isn't always everybody's favorite, but if you can tie it in and make the crucible, you know, it wasn't, a, the crucible is not on my 2023 reading list, right? So, but once you start tying it to something else that's more relevant to me or relevant to the world, um, again, you pick such a great topic because it's super relevant for the exact time that your learners are living right now, right? So you brought the why super close. You didn't say you've got to write these essays because you're going to need to in, in college, right? It's business leaders need help right now. Will you guys step up and, and help? So much fun. What, what else do you have on this, this PBL unit, Carolyn? I think you've hit like that you crushed it with this one and your learners obviously went along on this journey with you. Um, are, are they, are they continuing? Do you see more in your future? What, what are your plans as you look forward? Um, so there are a couple of things that I wish I would have done mm, yeah, sooner. Um, so I did not jump into the mini workshops and um, I wish I had done that sooner. Uh, we experimented more with it lately, and it's been a, it has been a game changer. Um, and I have used that kind of protocol to call out some of my students who have been saying like, oh, I don't know how to do this, or can you reteach? So like claim is a big deal in the English world. When you write, you have to have a clear claim. At mm -hmm. least I have to know what you're saying. Um, and by 11th grade, they've learned that if they act like they don't know it, um, that we just spend the day reteaching it. And it's kind of an easy day for them in class. Well, I've used your like mini workshop protocol that when I see a, a problem with an essay, I now just say like, you five, we're gonna do a mini workshop or anyone who needs help with claim, stop where at, you know, at 9.15, that's what we're doing. And it's amazing how much better their claims have gotten without me having to do a whole lot of work because um, they know they can't get away with it. So it's a very, that was a very cool, thing yeah so those that's, who need help are getting it but those who are kind of like faking their way through it have learned they can't do that anymore right so where do you where do you think that came from why are they why are your learners so engaged in that or it sounds like it kind of changed your classroom dynamic even right because it's and she's going to put me in that in that workshop if i don't write a good claim i better write right. one right was well, that kind of what happened yeah so, so i think yeah. what has happened and it's it was an unintentional thing. Um, when we do these quarterly writing focuses, um, 
that there are certain things that every teacher looks for. And these start in sixth grade. So I think for the students and, and you know, I think it's something we're working on, but they're hearing the same thing over and over and over again from sixth grade to 11th grade. So they haven't committed any kind of, um, not that they haven't committed to memory, but their feeling is, oh, we're gonna hear this again. We're gonna do this again. Um, and now I'm leveling it up. So mm -hmm. you know, we're gonna, the expectation is not that you can write a claim, it's that you can write a really articulate and clear claim now. Um, so these mini workshops have helped me kind of like level up um, what they're doing. And I can also, um, my classroom's a huge mixed bag of levels. It also allows me to target the students who really need help without it being clear that I'm targeting the student who really needs help. Mm -hmm. um, so they're part of it instead of being kind of called out. Yeah, that's a great equity piece, I think, right? Because yeah. you're just going to the workshop because you need to learn things. We all need to learn things, right? And maybe you go this time, you don't go next time, right? Yeah, that's so neat. Well, Carolyn, this has been a super fun PBL unit to share. Do you have any other kind of final thoughts on this one that you'd like to share with the audience? Um, I think my only kind of final thought is that if you're hesitating, don't. It really is. I know I, I feel like an ad when I say it because you know, I'm the only person in my department who went to the training who's part of this. And everyone I talk to is like, we have to get PBL into our English department. Like we have to do it. So I sound like a walking ad, but the engagement has been so much higher um, when I do PBL than when I'm not doing it. Um, and the kids know, like they're excited for the days where they're delving into a real world concern versus like boring English stuff. So my, my closing thought is that to give it a try and your students will also forgive you if you fail because we had a lot of failures along the way and it what a learning goal for them to see that failure is okay and that we bounce back from it yep yeah you did such a great job of of even modeling the growth mindset for them right which is a big deal that they don't have to be perfect right we're just going to keep growing together and you'll continue to grow on your journey i love that you're the spokesperson there in your school and you know, making that work. And, you know, I think I'm sure we'll have a workshop again this summer so, to take you to the next level. Right. And so there's just a ton to learn, but once you, once you see it, you can't unsee it. Right. It, it's just, it's just so good. You can't see Carolyn Nadi, but she is. And it's, it's what we do in, in PBL, right. It's just because it's, it's why I've been doing this for a decade and I'll just talk to anybody about it that stops long enough on the street is once you see what it does to learners in the classroom, the way they engage, they never have before. You just can't go back. Say, well, why, why, why? Well, because like, here's a learner story because of Katie, because of Brian, because of Billy, right? You've got these stories of kids that are suddenly awakened and like figuring out who they are and doing work for the first time in, in a real fashion and like thinking sometimes for the first time, failing for the first time. When you see these things happen, the growth that comes from it, you just can't get away from it. It's really exciting. Carolyn, thank you so much for sharing today. It was such a great share. Thank you for having me. All right. Well, you heard it there, PBL Simplified uh, listeners. W what a great example of a PBL showcase. So 11th graders out on the East Coast are jumping in to help small business owners improve the culture in their businesses. Like, Do you think that's going to improve the culture in the classroom? Of course. Do you think it's going to improve the culture of the relationships that they have? Yes. Like, There are a ton of employability skills that are being shown here and grown here. Uh, they're learning professional skills. It's a really fun one to walk through. Make sure you share this with your teachers so they can hear it and start to understand what project-based learning is all about. And as you do that, you'll engage your learners, tackle boredom, and transform your classrooms. Thank you for listening to this episode of the PBL Simplified Podcast. Would you help us achieve our vision of 51 by 2051? One small step you can take to help us out is to leave a review of the PBL Simplified podcast. Scroll down to the bottom of our show page, select a star rating, and leave a review. Your review helps others find this podcast. When you leave a review, the next visionary leader will see your words and join us. Thank you for leading Inspired. Inspired.